Fintech Miniconf. Um, so our next speaker is Jay Rosenbaum, and they are a contemporary figurative artist um, working in 2D modeling, also traditional painting, um, with a, a great background um, in kind of classical art as well. Um, and they have a, a presentation today about um, mixed reality and art, the quest for the shiny. So this is not just really um, an exploration of their own practice, but also um, I guess providing a few kind of hints and, and gotchas into how we all as artists can make sense um, of this without really getting caught up in the shiny. Uh, so without further ado, I'm going to give it over to Jay. Thanks so much, Mark. <laughs> ah. Thank you all so much. So I'm an artist working with new media and the latest technologies. It all began three years ago during my Masters of Contemporary Art at the VCA where I worked to create a series of works on non-binary transness in a binary state, or 3D modeled human figures that defy gender binaries with an exploration of transness uh, through an augmented reality application and machine learning based interactions. It's really refreshing to be able to talk about it like that. I loved studying at the VCA, but it's not a technological school. I, so I actually became a bit adept at communicating all of these technical aspects in non-technical ways. I talked about the ghost in the machine and the dreams of computers. I came into the VCA as a painter with 3D as a tool to help me paint. And somewhere within its non-technologically hallowed halls, I became a purely a new media artist working with some of the latest technologies. New media art doesn't appear on a lot of people's radars, and when it does, the technical parts have often been outsourced. To be successful in new media art, it seems you need loads of money to be able to hire the nerds you need to produce the vision that you have. So we get an image of an artist as a visionary, but not an image of an artist as a nerd. Except I'm a nerd. I'm a huge, ridiculous, proud nerd. And I also happen to be an artist. And finally, I have comfortably merged the two within myself into a cohesive whole. I came into my master's degree as a painter, using 3D modeling to create the life models I needed for reference to get the lighting and the anatomy right. But I couldn't afford life models, and it turns out the real humans won't hover for you upside down at 3 a.m. anyway. Luckily, open source and mixed licensing came to my rescue with Blender, Make Human, um, Daz 3D and Lux Render. All of these are free platforms for 3D modeling and development and rendering, and they've become increasingly powerful over the years. I first explored 3D modeling via the Make Human project and saw a way forward to create the figures I saw in my head that I never seemed to see in real life. I could dial male and female attributes together, mix them, tie them in. I never knew that my gender was the reason for all of this. I didn't know it was fluid until much later. But I, now, I got to really, really see all of these things that I could see in my head and feel how I wanted them to be. I now use the Genesis project by Daz 3D. Now com it's combined um, with sophisticated render engines like Lux Render to fully realize my visions. Using Genesis, I can work with an androgynous model and mix and match with any physical attributes I wish. The works are put through a deep neural network to allow the computer to compare the work to a reference image or artifact and dream of its own interpretation. I have little interpretation, I have, sorry, little interpretation. I have little influence in this output. It uses machine learning to create the result and the reaction is still always a surprise to me. The reaction you see through the augmented reality app on your phone is the result of my computer's artistic imagination. My final series of works for my masters were photographic style prints of my final renders and a collection of laser cut MDF or abstract pieces based on the final result of the machine learning. Inside the app, each work would resolve to a series of machine learning based animations. When I started conceptualizing these augmented reality works, I despaired over the initial quotes I was given. I'm a starving artist, I'm really not wealthy. And, uh, but uh, so I looked around and there are options for developing augmented reality uh, on your own if you're not afraid of a little code. It's seen as unusual in the art world to do these things for yourself. You do the painting yourself unless you're above that pay grade like Damien Hirst. But the back end programming, it's totally different. But is it really? Is 3D modeling on a computer that different to clay modeling or rendering that different to photography? Is programming that different to writing? 
It's a different, a different language, or several usually. But in the end, it's another medium to explore, another technique to conquer. And with Stack Overflow and GitHub and Unity, there are amazing resources out there to help anyone, even artists. Because the future of art really is new media. This has been said since the 80s, but the art world moves really slowly. I've seen that idea catching up now with the shiny new technologies available to us, like mixed reality and machine learning based art, with the idea that we can blur the lines between the real and the digital, and we can create new worlds out of thin air. And now we're starting to see more and more amazing works made with machine learning and mixed reality. And I'm astounded because I'm still barely scratching the surface, but here I am three years in creating artwork using augmented reality, style transfers, semantic photographic transfers, texture synthesis, and generative adversarial networks. I'm working on generating stories using image classifiers and text generation and working collaboratively with my computer as an artist and a programmer. Sorry. There's something so delightful about people who are looking through their phones at my figures, who are looking at their phones. It's a beautiful recursion of technology and engagement, a new way of looking at the world. So often we see all this commentary about uh, complaining about the pervasiveness of smartphones and uh, without exploring the very beautiful ways it connects us all together, without acknowledging the fact that we have the sum total of humanity's knowledge at our fingertips. There are always people griping about selfies and narcissism without exploring the very real ways that selfies have of making us feel valid in our own skin, especially when we can't always control the way the world sees us. Much of my work has been on the nature of non-binary transness in a binary state, as so many of us live as non-binary people on a gender spectrum in a world that insists on being blue or pink, male or female, I felt it was appropriate to explore this nature within a system that sees things essentially as on or off, one or zero. My work represents those of us who live on, in that spectrum outside the binary and often have difficulty fitting into the rigid societal norms so often enforced upon us. My work also explores the nature of passing and not passing as the gender you are, the complex nature of your internal monologue not matching your exterior, and how, if you're in a gender that changes regularly, your body may or may not fit you at any time, sometimes without warning. The trapped in the wrong body narrative still persists. The narrative of trans people wanting to change their bodies is pervasive, and trans people who cannot or do not wish to transition are underrepresented. There's a sense that we're less valid somehow for if we choose not to transition for whatever reason. I can't speak for all the different varieties of transness, but I can say that there is a lack of visibility for trans people who do not fit the mold of wanting to change themselves. This project shows people in varying stages of self-acceptance, of exploring their bodies as they are, unashamed. They're gods, inspired by archaeological artifacts and classical art. With a modern twist, they're a vision of acceptance and emergence, showing that there's no wrong way to have a body. I'm drawn to the notion that my figures exist in a world of their own, that they have a digital life in a digital world, where digital and uh, real uh, meld together to create something more than we are now, and these works are a glimpse into that future. The machines will learn and grow and pass the singularity and begin to think on their own. And humans will grow and change and merge alongside them until we cross a digital frontier and it all merges with our own, where binaries no longer matter and nothing counts beyond the mind and thought and creativity. When I started working on this for my masters, my supervisor asked the question, where does the work lie in a digital artwork? When does it become real? And I've pondered that question constantly. I come from a traditional painting background, and my 3D modeling has gone from being my reference material to being at the forefront of my creative practice. In painting, the question's simple. The work is real when you paint it and you hang it up. But for a digital work, is it real when it's in the computer? Is it real when it's printed? The capabilities of new media are so much greater 
than a painting, a static painting or a sculpture, and we need to be able to address this. To move beyond the traditional notions of, white, uh, of art in a white-walled space, to going so much further than that. This is my attempt to move beyond that notion where I feel like the figure's been nailed like a lifeless butterfly on the wall to a different space altogether, allowing the viewer to enter their world, if only a little. Augmented reality is my answer. If we can look to the physical work on the wall, to the work on the screen, and see it come to life inside our phones. We can see it exists in a 3D plane, in a digital world of its own, a world where we're starting to be able to teach computers how to think and create art for themselves with minimal assistance from a human. It was important to me that these works looked as though there was little human involvement. From the digital print to the computer-guided laser cutting to the deep neural network-based code that produced the abstracted results, the machine learning response is a way to show transitioning without transitioning and an internal spectrum rather than a physical one. My process has been refined and distilled, as any artist does. I find inspiration by looking at sculptures and classic artworks and archaeological artifacts, reading myths and drawing at my ideas as I get them. I draw inspiration from selfies and from selfie culture and the notion of turning that traditional male gaze inward, taking that gaze back. I take some of the original concepts and I shift them, alter the gender expression in different ways, often very subtle. The pose may be enhanced or changed in my mind. The angle may change. The works are informed by the inspiration, but not exactly necessarily mimicking. In this example, I have a Memento Mori piece by Cambiasso that I reinterpreted for my own series. The skull became the phone, and the figure's pose became a slightly twisted to produce a more masculine air. So we end up with a very different work, but one that references the original inspiration. A gray, lifeless, androgynous shape stares at me from within my screen. I grant it life. I grant it primary and secondary gender characteristics. I give it skin. The gender characteristics do not matter. The skin is just skin. The genitals of the person whose skin was scanned is irrelevant. It's just disembodied now, and it belongs to my figure. I move from being the sculptor to the puppeteer and lovingly help them into position. I provide everything they need in their world, a phone, a stage, a backdrop, some lighting. I drop piece after piece of fabric to get the physics right and create, create the right angle, the proper level of wind and gravity to get that perfect effect that I need. And then I shift once more to photographer. I light my virtual stage and craft the key lights to create the best results. The camera, in this case, is a rendering engine called Lux. Lux is a physically based render engine that takes everything in the scene and calculates how the light would affect each and every surface, just as if it were real. The light penetrates the skin just a little bit. In technical terms, it's called subsurface scattering, but that's a technical term for something that infuses breath and blood into the bodies, however artificially. It makes the skin look supple, Nude skin is alive, glowing, the light catching the surface and creating natural highlights. Like a photographer, I place everything correctly, apply my settings and just hope for the best. I create dozens of renders waiting for that perfect shot, that one moment when it all works. I know it works when I feel the figure breathe, when I know they're alive somehow. Where does the life emerge from within the figure? In the skin? In the lighting? The figures are often expressionless, but the lighting gives them a stolid strength, a solidity, a shift from sculptor to photographer to programmer to historian and back again until I have the result I'm after. Once I receive the render I like, usually after hundreds of tiny fabric pose and lighting tweaks, it's time to give it my, uh, to my computer to dream its own interpretation. I start with the source inspiration, the original piece that informed the work and I put it through a machine learning algorithm called Neural Style. This is a style transfer algorithm programmed in Lua and running on the Torch framework that takes the style of one image and transposes it onto another. I take my render and my inspiration and enter the parameters I need and allow the iterative process to run its course. The final result is sometimes a mess to begin with, but it's a jumping off point for further exploration. It may be I need to find the magic combination of parameters and strength of transfer and abstraction, and other times I may need a different style image. 
Sometimes I just know the piece I want to use as my style image, and sometimes it's a lengthy quest to find the perfect one. If we return to the Cambiasso image, I used the painting as the style the image in this case. And it created a very pleasing chiaroscuro effect, reminiscent of the original work. I can never say what the results are going to be or what will work best, but as I progress in my machine learning knowledge and research, I'm improving all the time in selecting the ideal parameters and image styles to transfer. It took me 250 pages of experimentation and exploration to get the 14 animations used in that first series of works, but it became easier each time. I know this because at my supervisor's request, I printed out the code and results, complete with all of my notations, swears, and emoji. Somewhere along all of my exploration into creating computer-generated art using code, I learned something I never successfully learned in programming class, how to document my code. And this has prov uh, proved so helpful. All of this research and diligence has uh, paid off as I've delved deeper into my programming and development. My earliest notes have been a boon to me, as I'm sure the ones I'm writing now will be to future me. There've been notes to myself from the past to help, my, uh, to help me as I traverse this landscape. Frameworks, simple issues, and app development. Everything gets recorded in Evernote. This helps me work through problems, but also helps me when I face a similar problem later on. And there's something incredible to writing out the code to fire it off. You never, know, you never quite know if it'll be a raging success, a complete disaster, or if you missed a space or a comma and it's just gonna fall over completely. My first few attempts were horrifying, but that first image, when it came out, that was a moment. It was created entirely by my computer. It didn't even matter that it was hideous. It was a result. It was a momentous occasion brought forth by my computer creating something new. It took two disparate works and united them to create its own thing. I'd created an art student. I've no doubt that we're seeing incredible things coming from autonomously generated computer art. But right now, I'm happy to be teaching an art student one that only occasionally talks back. The way the computer chooses to interpret the work is a mystery. The most exciting moment for me is when a, the neural network adds a color that isn't present in either the render by me or the style image I used to um, make it, uh, to define it. The color blooms across the surface in animation, and that's the moment I feel the presence of the ghost in the machine, the unexpected and unpredicted outcome. The deep purple here is not present in either the render by me or the Greek vase I use for reference. It's an addition added purely by the computer. I know it's probably a result of a color aberration in adjacent pixels that the computer just ran with, but it chose that color. It decided to emphasize it, and that is when a piece becomes more successful to me, a splash of digital purple in a Greek vase-inspired work. That moment when I see a random color bloom, that's a moment I'm proud to be an artist working in this field. There's a sense of rightness of working collaboratively with my computer as an artist. When I receive the machine learning result I'm after, I create tighter iterations until I have a tidy group of less than 20 that animate smoothly. At this point, I've created the works that are going to make up the piece, but I've yet to tie them together, and that's where the unity comes in. In deciding to develop an augmented reality app, I tested AR solutions for Morasma, Layar, Wikitude, and Vuforia, before eventually settling on Vuforia for ease of use and full software development kit options. And the price point didn't hurt either. I knew I was looking, uh, after looking at Orasma and Layar, that I really wanted to develop the app myself to give it a unified aesthetic at a reasonable price point. But I, and I knew I wanted the ability to use photographic images as my reaction image. I wanted the ability to expand the app as needed. Both Wikitude and Vuforia had the features I was after, but Vuforia had more options for expanding my app later, such as 3D object scanning, which I still have yet to use, but I'm really excited about it. 
It was important to me that the app be available to download on the viewer's own devices. And for that, I needed to be able to produce a full release ready app for the App Store and Google Play on an extremely tight budget. I relied heavily on this resource for all of my development needs. This was my very first mobile app. And after reading all of the documentation on getting an app approved and how the very last thing you should do is try to publish the very first app you made for school, I was super prepared to publish my very first app I made for school. So I armed myself with a somewhat shaky understanding of Unity and an even shakier understanding of Xcode and Android Editor, and I started building my app. I created a very minimal interface, nothing to distract from the artwork, and imported the SDK. With Vuforia, you add the images in their web interface first. Then you download the data in a Unity package ready for import. The images are encoded with that recognition information ready to be put to use. The ratings show how clear the image is as a target, with, the sharp, with sharp intersections being the strongest for recognition purposes. And it seems that all the horror stories I'd read were perhaps a bit overblown. My app was approved on both stores on the first attempt, and you can download them now on Google Play and Apple. <laughs> Augmented reality is such a wonderful, shiny bridge for digital artists looking to explore the real and the digital and bring people into digital art forms. We live inside our devices these days. It's only to be expected that our art embraces this and that our world is richer for it. The ability to layer a virtual world onto the real one and enhance our realities in so many ways is, is so exciting. And it's an amazing way to add color and life to the world around us and art to the everyday. It enables people to look further within a piece to see and unlock other content that artists could only allude to before. It adds further dimensionality to our work. AR brings art to everyone around us. Everyone with a smartphone can access it from their screens or in the wild. People can feel connected to it. The interactivity of AR-enabled work seems to bring people together. A conversation is started between the viewer and the work and between the viewers themselves. They always talk about it, even if they've never met each other. I see conversations starting all the time and it's wonderful. Art goes from being the province of the few to being more accessible. I've moved from working with purely image-based targets with 2D animations to adding in interactive 3D sculptures that use Unity's inbuilt level of detail rendering system to alter the sculpture depending on the viewer's proximity. These sculptures are served from light boxes with laser cut markers and appear lit from underneath and they fracture and change as the viewer moves closer or further. This invites comment on biological essentialism and the need to focus in and pick apart the bodies of trans people, often while ignoring the person they are. My next body of work was called Unnatural, an exploration of naiads, dryads, and nereids from Greek and Roman mythology, using technology to create modern interpretations of classical creatures of nature. Using the highly technological, with the highly natural, invites discussion about how at odds we are to the natural world and how we might use technology to better connect with the environment and assist our planet. It need not be an either or thing, but an opportunity to explore and evolve within ourselves. The anthropomorphization of environmental concerns assists with the empathy towards the environment and its needs. Many artificial intelligence advocates believe that artificial intelligence is the way forward to helping our planet heal itself, to making great strides in cleaning the oceans and the air, growing more plants and pushing back the damage humans have done. In this case, it made sense to me to use a neural network trained on nature to create images for, based on my work by uniting this vision of the future with a vision of the past. I hope to show a way forward. This series relies much more heavily on artificial intelligence-based work, with the majority of the prints being based on an algorithmic abstraction using multi-scale neural texture synthesis. It uses similar data to style transfers by determining how often a color or effect repeats and creates its own high-resolution texture from a small sample. It becomes a very convincing abstraction. 
from here, I started using the anima results with animations to create animated iterative style transfers. One of the reasons I switched from Torch to Lua, uh, uh, Torch and Lua to TensorFlow and Python, apart from stability, is because this particular version allows me to specify a in different initial starting point for the abstraction rather than the style or the content. That way I can build on the iterative static animations to create animations that build in style and, uh, as they animate. Figures that emerge from their print and their domains swirling in leaves or bathed in dappled light between branches. I've also built on my interactive sculptures, creating more complex ones. They're figures that explode into leaves or collapse into waves shimmering in the app. I've had to level up my knowledge of physics in Blender quite substantially, but it's been fun to explore all of these new concepts and shiny technologies in this way. And I find that while these works are not explicitly about gender and transness, I can't escape it in my work. Gender is inherent to everything I do. It's at my core and everything I make expresses that. I know my works are always inherently queer because it's part of who I am. I'm obsessed with the potential for machine learning and augmented reality in art, for collaborating with computers and handheld devices and headsets to add layers onto this world pixel by pixel, to blur the line between the real and the not real and explore new concepts in a post-digital age. But I always have to remember to keep my eyes on the prize to not just keep getting distracted by the next shiny thing. My next phase of research, and heading into my PhD, examines gender through the lens of computer vision. Hidden Worlds explores how computers see us. We live in an age where identity can be simulated easily, where believable celebrities can be imagined whole by a computer, and faces can be stolen where our, our eyes can easily be tricked, but what about artistic modes of computer vision and creation? Image classifiers give us clues into computer uh, modes of perception, but sometimes their solutions are mystifying. I want to explore that space in between where art and technology meet. I want to explore gender as it's created and perceived by computers. And I want to explore some of the most exciting areas of machine learning all those shiny new technologies that keep emerging and getting me excited, always keeping in mind that question, where's the art, where's the work? I began this series of works with the shiniest of deep learning technologies, a generated adversarial network. A GAN takes a data set of images and learns to make its own based on what it sees. The generator makes the work while a discriminator judges it based on the source material. As the discriminator passes some works and fails others, the generator learns to make more works that pass the test. In this case, I was going for an abstract feel. The data set was small. It was only 16,000 images, a bit over that, of Greek and Roman statuary. The nature of curation and critique is a constant here. The artist curates a data set of thousands of images to work, for the machine to work with. The discriminator critiques the result. I curate and critique the results that pass the discriminator. And while curating a data set, I find myself slipping into a form of meditative state. I became the discriminator of this series of photographs as I prepared them. I see the photographs and I cut the ones that don't fit and I find myself daydreaming of the results and what I hope to see. I know the generator and discriminator don't daydream, but it's easy to imagine that they do. The works that come out are dreamlike, undefined, but gaining in definition and resolve as the machine learns. You don't have much control of what the machine will generate past that. It's an exercise in letting go working with generative art, but the results in the end came close to what I'd hoped to find. I found myself hoping for bodies who were missing limbs, reflecting the amount of broken statuary I saw, and figures blending gender characteristics. I wanted to create new, unidealized sculptures for those of us who never got to see ourselves realized as gods. Once the data set was complete, I started the weeks of training of the neural network. I'd load the images as they were generated in the latent space of training and watch as it learned. Sifting through these images for ones that inspired me was another exercise in curation. And I watched as the concept evolved in my head. 
I took some of my favorites and I just started to draw into them on my iPad, just testing out ideas while I waited. I knew what I wanted to say, but not quite how I wanted to say it. Finally, I started to watch as the network collapsed. It started to create the same images over and over as the generator decided only one image would truly satisfy the discriminator. The generated works were abstract as expected, but with recognizably human shapes. As the data set was extremely idealized, it was a delight to see exaggerated bodies and delightful curves emerge, works beyond what I'd hoped to find. I delighted in the textures and the shapes I saw emerging. I selected my favorites and made drawings of what I saw in the works, the figures emerging within the abstract forms. From those drawings, I made 3D models, and from those models, I made augmented reality interactions. While close, you see something abstracted, but as you move back, it resolves into something more tangible and real. Like with pointillism and cubism, you can appreciate the details close. It's only until you step back and take in the entire work that the forms start to resolve into something more than the sum of their parts. It also reflects the training process of the works, the slow coming into being of certain forms. Some final artworks stood well with just the drawings saved as animations, and some felt best with the 3D models attached. I also trained a neural network that specialized in writing captions for images in more, more poetic language. And I, I trained it to turn captions into short stories so that it could write a narrative about the works created by the GAN and the works created by me in response. It would detect features in the image, then create a short caption and write a narrative about that caption. The results for this were random but fascinating, often only tangentially related to the subject, but with a soft romance to the phrasing that I found compelling. The images and the different 3D models were submitted to the narrative writer, which generated passages, or created passages of generated text. I did some minor edits to the texts, just grammatical stuff, and had a text to speech synthesizer speak the words. It felt important to have a digital voice as the narrators of this project. And I feel particularly pleased with how the gender of the subject flips around seemingly at random. The gender of the people in these works feels fluid, and I'm obscurely proud that the machines saw and automatically produced these gender fluid results. From here, I united them all together in unity, the spoken word, the music based on the generated captions, and the interactions, captions, and options to turn off the sound were added and submitted to the different app stores. This series is a true collaboration for me between my computer and myself. The art is generated by machine with the information I provided it. I then worked back into the, its results and submitted them back to the machine to see its interpretation of my interpretation. Back and forth we'd go, and creating work, creating art based on that work, a mini collective of two. I've often been asked why I chose augmented reality for my works, often with a thinly veiled insinuation that VR is where it's really at. But AR is not just a shiny buzzword. It's more accessible, not just for people with disabilities or people with visual impairments or seizures, but also for the average person who's more cautious around technology, not any of us, but it, there's a magic to downloading an app to your own device that allows you to see something new in an artwork. I see it all the time. It's a magic window that allows you to see something more, a lens. It ends up being a smoother experience for people who would not otherwise try to access mixed reality technology. Keeping our work simple and feature meaning rich will uh, help everyone embrace new technologies in art. The works I've created have been made with mostly free technologies. The largest barrier for entry has been the cost of being a registered developer. There are so many free or inexpensive options for 3D modeling, for game development, for augmented reality solutions. There aren't that many barriers to getting started and trying to create works to exploring these new technologies and new avenues for self-expression. New media is an excellent option for a generation of artists who can't afford models, can't afford paint and canvas and printing costs. There are free solutions out there for every one of your ideas. 
and the tools to help you make your own solutions. The important thing is to get out there and try to develop and test and explore and then to find your voice, find what you want to say and bring the two together to create something no one has ever seen before. Because as always, the future of art is meaning. I'm always looking for the next quest, the next shiny, the next useful item I could squirrel away to use at a later date. I live inside computer generated worlds, not just with my work, but my relaxation as well. I guess the best part about being an artist specializing in 3D modeling and using products like Unity is, is that I can play games and call it research. Because <laughs> it's true. Everything you do has an impact on your work when you're a creator. You have no idea what the media you absorb is going to inspire. So, of course, I take it upon myself to read, watch, play, lots. Because you never know when inspiration's going to strike. I have a massive file of ideas involving VR, robots, 3D printing, machine learning, augmented reality. I have to actively try to stop my mind from trying to split in a hundred different directions at once. As it chases each shiny new idea, I keep them all in Evernote. I'm constantly fighting against being caught up in the quest for the next big thing. Like an RPG, I'm always drawn to the next shiny item, the next challenge. And being a tech artist, that just allows me to have more excuses to explore the technology that excites me the most. This can be a curse and a blessing. As I, and I know you all understand what I mean when I say what a distraction the latest shiny technology can be. And tech like AR and VR are shiny and exciting. Machine learning is shiny and exciting. I get so caught up in all of the amazing things I can do and learn, all the different things I can try and all the ways I can go higher, faster, further, more. I get so excited by what I could do, sometimes I forget why or even if I should. And that brings me back to the question from my supervisor. As an artist, I have to step back and say, wait, but why? What is, going to, what is this going to say? Where is the artwork in all of this work? And that is the key question when making art. Whether it's a painting, a sculpture, or an augmented reality installation with 3D modeling and machine learning based interactions. It's one thing to want to make the thing or to be able to make the thing. The main question is why? I ran against this question a lot. I know some people consider mixed reality to be gimmicky, but I believe that mixed reality gives us a unique capability to tap into the minds of our viewers. Art, like tech, is about experimentation. It's about absorbing information from everywhere and everything and distilling it into messages from your brain. We're trying to make a difference, to create feelings and experiences in a viewer that they may never have felt before. We constantly quest to find our order in chaos. In many ways, this is what the basis of art is, trying to make sense of ourselves and our world. We create the concepts we absorb. VR and AR are perfect tools for hacking the viewer if you use them correctly. They're uniquely placed to alter the world of the viewer in a very literal way, to draw them into the art, which is why what we have to say is of even more importance. We encounter so much through a screen these days. We process our news, thoughts, socialization, relationships through the lens of a screen. We game, gamify, discuss, fight, consume, collaborate, support and celebrate on a daily basis on our phones, our tablets, our computers. This digital frontier is for us the norm, a way to keep in touch with people on the other side of the world or on the other side of the room. We have the power as artists to draw people inside our worlds, to make them see things in new ways, to craft narratives and concepts and change people's minds. What avenues are open to expression if artists open their minds to the idea of allowing viewers to take part in their worlds, to go beyond the viewing experience, to connecting with it, to allowing themselves to be immersed within the mind's eye of the artist. The scrutiny turned on new media works means they have to be well executed and powerfully meaningful. What we choose to do with its power will determine the future of mixed reality in art. 
in the validity of new technology hinges on its message. The future viability of that work and the future history of the piece will be forever marked by what you have to say just as much as how you say it. Using these new tools as masterfully as possible is of course vital. Just as all artists must become masters of their medium, the pieces need to resonate. And with tools readily and often freely available and the open minds of the viewers, we can ensure an excellent connection between the viewer and the content, between the real and the digital. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jay. That was amazing. Um, we do have time for uh, a handful of questions. Um, I actually have one I want to start with. Uh, how have you found the, um, the visual art and um, painting establishment? Um, how, how do they approach your work and, and what, what have their reactions been? That's a really interesting question. Um, I think that, so some of them, like they go in, I, I, I've had a, a bit of a experience with sort of seeing some of the critics and some of the old school, they'll come in, oh no, 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 no. And then they see the interaction and they're like, wait, wow. <laughs> they, they actually, they never thought that they would see something like that. And so at first they think it's a bit ridiculous, but then if, if they get, uh, become part of the interaction and they see it, they, start to appreciate it more. There's, there's still a bit of a, yeah, it's, it can be a bit interesting in the art world, but um, the tech art world is very good as well. So I think that we're gaining ground. <laughs> cool, thank you. Does anyone else have a question? I'll come and bring the mic to you. Cool. <laughs> okay. Have you open sourced any of your own um, code that you've used to create these works? I've open sourced the, um, the Bash scripts <laughs> that I used to, uh, so the iterative animations and things like that. Um, they're all available on my GitHub. Um, they're, it's, it's, it's kind of embarrassing, yay, I've, I've put some bash scripts up, but uh, they actually made a huge difference to when you're processing massive bash, uh, batches of um, uh, images to create an animation, because they're all saved as individual images, uh, it's, it helps to have scripts to do all of that. And so, yeah, I've published all the automation scripts. Um, I haven't, I've changed some of the code uh, in, that I've been working with, but all the code that I work with is, is available online, so yeah. I've linked to it all in my thing. 